What to do today? What to do? What to do? Hey, not bad. Nice fit. Here's looking at you, Sam. Play it again. What the? San Francisco is a beautiful city. Cable cars, fog rolling off the bay, Chinatown, the Golden Gate Bridge, the wharf. Gee, I wish I lived there. The dust had to be an inch deep on my desk. A thick layer of papers was forming around the base of the trash can. An empty bottle of milk lay on the floor next to the couch where I had a business engagement the night before. Coffee, Sam? Yeah. Kitty wasn't much on keeping an office clean, but she could make a great cup of coffee. I still remember the day she came in looking for work. She wanted to be a secretary. She had all her requirements. She made a great cup of coffee. I gave her a job. That was yesterday. Being a private dick isn't easy with a name like Sam Spade. But I got all the requirements. I like babes and bullets. And I look kind of neat in a trench coat. More coffee, Sam? Nah. It was a slow day. The hours seemed to drag by like a New York Giants versus Brooklyn Dodgers doubleheader. I decided to get a phone. As I was leaving the office, I found myself face to face with one of the most beautiful creatures I'd ever seen. Are you Spade? I never know how to answer that question. So what brings you here, and why me? There are a hundred private investigators in town with better offices than mine. Who are you? My husband was murdered. Your chief, Tanyo Tabby, will you take the case? I had to think for a minute, sure. Judging from the way she was dressed, she was obviously tapping some big bucks. Of course. It all makes sense now. She marries an old geezer, bumps him off, inherits all the money, hires a second-rate investigator to find the killer who she double-crosses and ends up scot-free. So how old was your husband, Mrs. Otabi? 23. Of course, it all makes sense now. Her husband was obviously a ladies' man. Tanya finds out he's unfaithful and has him snuffed. She hires a second-rate detective to find the killer, who she double-crosses and ends up scot-free. It's one of the oldest shams in the book. So what did your husband do for a living, Mrs. Otabi? He was at St. Morris University, Mr. Spade. He was head of the history department. Something wasn't right here. Sounds like a pretty tame profession, doll. Not exactly the kind of job where enemies can be made. We all have enemies, don't we, Mr. Spade? Call me Sam, please. What makes you think your husband was murdered? He drove off Old Mountain Road, Sam, please. That's 40 miles away. He had no reason to be there. Besides, he was an excellent driver. The police say he probably fell asleep at the wheel. But I just can't believe that. Her lips started to tremble. I took her hands in mine. Go home, kid. I got work to do. I'll call you when I got some. My life's full of babes and bullets. No time to lay back and cool it. I've got clues and claws. Nothing to do but do it. Flaws and clues are my beat. I pay my dues on the street. A life full of babes and bullets. It's a living, that's why I do it.
Why someone would murder a 23-year-old college professor was beyond me. Maybe he'd deliver just one too many lectures on the Boxer Rebellion. Stranger things have happened in this town. My first stop was the city morgue. It was 11 a.m. Walking up the steps to the morgue, I saw my old adversary. It was Lieutenant Washington. Spade, what brings you down here? Trying to find a client? Sure, Lieutenant. He's the one your blue boy shot in the back for jaywalking. Watch it, Spade. I still have your license under investigation. Oh, yeah? Well, at least I know it's safe for a while. Spade, don't push me. Wouldn't dream of it, Lieutenant. Have a nice day. The lieutenant was still saying goodbyes as I walked into the morgue. I spotted the coroner, Bert Fleebish. Spade, what brings you down here? Hey, Bert, I need to see a body. Who doesn't, eh, Sam? <laughs> What's the name? Professor Otebi. Oh, yeah, tough break. Nice fella. You knew him? Oh, not really. My kid attended St. Morris and had his class. Really liked him, too. Except for his lectures about the Boxer Rebellion. I could tell Bert sort of liked the guy by the way he pulled out the drawer with the stiff. Otabi looked like he'd been worked over by the maulers of the Midway. It didn't surprise me. When's the autopsy scheduled, Bert? Autopsy? What autopsy? His wife thinks it was murder, Bert. Murder? <laughs> Sam, the man died in a disastrous car accident. Looking down at Otabi, I noticed some yellowish-brown coloration on his chest and stomach hairs. Hey, Bert, you have any explanation for this? Any kind of fluid from a car can make a stain like that. Do you have his clothes and any items he had on him when he was discovered? Uh, sure, Sam. Right here. I searched through the clothing looking for anything that might suggest murder. Right now, it looked as though poor Otabi had just had a bad break on the mountain. His shirt was about the only item of clothing that was still recognizable. I noticed the yellowish-brown stains were in the same location on the shirt that they were on the body. I'd seen stains like this before, but where? Maybe something would come to me later. There was a curious little stone in the shirt pocket. It was a very colorful stone on one side, uh, almost as though it were painted. I'll uh, be right back, Sam. Sure, that's what my ex-wife said. As Bert went to answer the phone, I put the colorful stone in my pocket. I don't know why, really. Maybe I just like stones. Is there anything else you need, Sam? A clue, a motive, and a murderer. Good night, Bert. Uh, Sam? Yeah, Bert? It's noon. It took me an hour to drive to the scene of the accident. I didn't know what I was going to find there, but what the heck, I'd at least get a breath of fresh air and I could put the car in the expense account. It looked like I wasn't the only one who had that idea. Taking a nature walk, Tanya? Sam, you startled me. I was trying to keep my mind on business, but I couldn't help but notice the lovely view. One word of advice, sweetheart. It's not smart to return to the scene of the crime. I was hoping to find a reason for my husband being here last Friday night. Like, what kind of reason? I don't know. A clue of some kind. I'd understand if you were here to cover up your tracks. Are you saying I murdered my husband? Nothing personal. Oh, Sam. <laughs> I hate when they do this. I stood there, Tanya's mascara dripping on my wingtips, and me an hour from the nearest pot of coffee. Come on, Tanya, let's find a diner. So why do you suspect me of murdering my husband? I suspect everybody, baby. Here's a list of suspects I've put together so far. Sam, your name's on this list. I don't remember where I was last Friday night, Tanya. Therefore, I don't have an alibi. I've been tailing myself for the past three days. That's sad. What's sad? You must be a very lonely man, Sam Spade. You could fix that, Tanya. What are you trying to tell me, Sam? Do I have to spell it out? Give it a shot. Y-O-U, C-O-U. There's a lot about me you don't know, Sam. I know you're great looking and you dress nice. But what if I did murder my husband? What would you think of me then? I'd wait for you to get out of prison, baby. It's not like my social calendar is exactly packed. How long can a murder sentence be? 30, maybe 40 years? 
I'll get it. The classiest dame I ever met just walked out of my heart, but not out of my case. Next on the list was Otabi's office at the university. I was still a couple of blocks from the campus when I brushed by a big goon on the sidewalk. He had fists the size of babies. He drug me into a darkened alley and pounded me into next year. As I lay there in a crumpled heap, I smiled to myself. I must be on the trail of something hot to rate a beating from this Neanderthal. I put my jaw back in place and pointed an accusing paw at my assailant. So, I suppose you have a message for me. Yeah, I'm your landlord. You're two months late with a rent. Right. I was still trying to figure out my landlord's involvement in this caper as I walked up the marble steps to the history building. Are you in charge around here? Yes, I'm Professor O'Felix. How may I help you? I'm Sam Spade, P.I. Oh, nice wallet, Mr. P.I. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to ask you a few questions about Professor O'Tabby. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. What a shame. Poor fellow must have fallen asleep at the wheel. Such a waste. I really don't know how I can help you, but I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Nice guy. He led me to his office and poured us a cup of coffee. I would have preferred my own cup. Now, what would you like to know, Mr. P.I.? Call me Sam. Sam Spade. Was Otabi in any kind of trouble that you know of? No, no trouble. Professor Otabi was a solid citizen. He was well respected by the faculty and his students. Besides, I, I don't know much about his personal life. Perhaps you should talk to his wife. His wife? Yeah, I've talked to her. According to the time of death, you must have been one of the last people to see Professor Otabi alive. Any idea what he was doing up on Old Mountain Road last Friday night? Yes, that much I do know. He was going to visit Marty O'Purr, a St. Morris alum. Why was he going there? Marty's a big contributor to the university, especially to the history department. Professor Otabi called on her every Friday night to help her in any way he could. You see, she's a widow. It was Morty's wish that no one know of his visits. She was, a, she was a bit eccentric in that regard. Of course, it all made sense now. Otabi, under the guise of visiting a benefactress to the university, was in fact having a clandestine affair with a wealthy widow. How old is Morty Oper? 93. Rats. Mr. Spade, I didn't mean to insinuate anything by my statement. It's just that... Well, on more than one occasion, Professor Otabi had to put a woman's feelings in perspective. You see, he was a handsome man and uh, quite popular with the ladies. So you don't think he ever gave in to temptation? Oh, no. His only weakness was coffee. I rarely saw him without a cup of it in his hat. Well, I think we all depend on a cup of joe every now and then. Thanks for the information, and no offense intended, but this is really lousy coffee. Yes, I admit my coffee needs work, Stan. The lady that normally made our coffee left us recently. She made excellent coffee. She's going to be hard to replace. In fact, <laughs> I've had to pick up her chores in addition to my own duties. Work on that coffee. By the time I arrived back at the office, the men from the phone company had just installed my phone. Kitty was in the other room. No calls yet, Sam. How about a cup of coffee? You read my mind, sweetheart. Hey, Kitty, do we have Tanya's phone number? Klondike 51234, Sam. Thanks. The girl might not be a good office cleaner, but she has a great memory. But why didn't I remember that number? It sure is an easy one to remember. Hello, Tanya. Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, but what did you find out? I stopped by your husband's office today and found out a few interesting things. Oh, really? Uh, who did you talk with? A Professor O'Felix. Do you know him? Professor O'Felix was my husband's assistant. Kind of old to be an assistant, isn't he? Oh, we never really thought of him as an assistant. He worked as hard as my husband with the students. He's been with the university all his life. In fact, he was my husband's instructor. It was Professor O'Felix who inspired my husband to go into the teaching profession. Yeah, well, that's nice. Anyway, Tanya, he mentioned your husband may have been tangled up with some woman. 
Gosh, that's hot. Sam, hello, Sam, are you okay? Oh, uh, look, Tanya, I'll call you back. I got a bit of a mess right now. <gasps> Sam, I'm sorry. I don't know what I was thinking about. It's okay, Kitty. Run and tell maintenance we need a mop and a bucket. I'll pick up the pieces of the mug. That hot coffee in the lap was enough to give a literal meaning to my last name. I went to the sink to clean up. As I took off my jacket, I saw a huge coffee stain covering my shirt. Wait a minute. Coffee stains. That's what they were. Otabi had coffee stains on his shirt. Why would a man that was dressed as impeccably as Otabi wear a coffee-stained shirt? Where did the coffee come from? And why am I talking to myself? I searched my pockets for the pretty painted stone I took from Otabi's shirt pocket. I looked at it carefully. It was painted, all right. A painted piece of ceramic. A piece of ceramic from a coffee cup. Otabi must have been drinking coffee, which in turn caused the accident. It wasn't much to go on. How was I supposed to solve a murder when my only clue was a cup of java? What was keeping Kitty? I figured I'd better call Tanya to apologize for the interruption and get back to the case. Where did I put Tanya's phone number? Wait a minute. Tanya never gave me a phone number. So how did Kitty know the number? Easy spade, don't go off the deep end. But the pieces were starting to fit together. Kitty would know the number if Tanya's husband gave it to her. Could she be a lady who was infatuated with Professor Otabi? Nah. Think, Spade, think. Of course. She spilled the coffee when I mentioned talking to Professor O'Felix about Otabi's woman trouble. Kitty makes a great cup of coffee. So did the girl who recently left the university. The same girl I hired only yesterday. A girl who was infatuated by a man she could never have. So what does she do? Of course, she spills coffee in his lap and pushes him over a cliff. Wait a minute. Something's not quite right here. Here's maintenance, Sam. I know you murdered Professor Otabi, Kitty. What are you talking about, Sam? You loved him. He didn't love you, so you snuffed him. So you what? So I lived. You lived? <laughs> yes. The thought of working at the university so close to him and not being able to have him was too much to bear. So I left. But I didn't murder him. <laughs> the tears were streaming down her face and falling like rain off a pine tree. But the coffee stains, the painted piece of ceramic cup. He always drank from his favorite mug, Sam. This looks like a piece from that mug. I don't know how it got broke. I just ran out of suspects. Kitty, did you have any duties in the office other than making coffee? Mm -hmm. I was Professor Rotabi's girl Friday. I sorted his mail, answered the phone, kept his appointment calendar, filled his prescriptions, sharpened his pencils. Wait a minute, filled his prescriptions? Yes, Professor Otabi was an insomniac. The coffee kept him awake. He needed very potent sleeping pills to help him doze off at night. I remember him bragging that one of those pills could knock out a bull elephant. It took two of them to put him to sleep, and that took an hour. Kitty, stay here and help maintenance clean up this mess. Where are you going, Sam? To pick up a murderer, baby. Nice touch. I found Professor O'Felix in the university chapel. Asking for forgiveness, Professor? For what it's worth, Mr. Spade, I just didn't have anything to lose. Let's go. By the time the paperwork was done, it was 8 p.m. Lieutenant Washington was his usual charming self as though Felix was being booked. It had been a long day. I thought I'd better check in on Kitty. She was pretty shaken up when I left. I entered my office and found Tanya Tabby sitting on the couch. She stood up sobbing and gently put her arms around me. She didn't say anything. She didn't have to. I understood. I don't understand. I saw you following me today. I wanted to make sure you were on the right track, Sam. Well, thanks for the hint. I knew a sharp guy like you would figure it out. 
Look, you big lug, why don't you cut the tough guy act and give me a smile for once? How's this? That's better. Now let's talk about you and me, baby. Wouldn't work, Sam. We're different. That's the part I like. Face it, Sam. In any other time, in any other place, we might have had something, you and me. Yeah, I guess you're right, Tanya. You're a sophisticated lady, and I'm just a working stiff. You like hot dogs, and I like caviar. Yeah. I'm refined, and you're a slob. Mm. I'm first class, and you're coach. I get the point, Tanya. But you're still all man, Sam. I really wish it could have worked out. I'll never forget you, Tanya. Goodbye, Sam. the murderer. She came right over. I didn't answer. My thoughts were still in the arms of a classy babe. There had better be a check in that envelope. Sam, how did you know O'Felix killed Professor Otabi? Elementary, Kitty. Otabi had to have left directly from the campus to call on Modi Opur that night because he was still drinking from his favorite mug when the crash occurred. Professor O'Felix, the substitute girl Friday, fixed that cup of coffee. O'Felix had filled Otabi's sleeping pill prescription and popped a couple into his coffee knowing it would take Otabi an hour to get to Old Mountain Road 40 miles away. Like clockwork, the pills took effect and Otabi drove off the road to his death. The police were right. Otabi did fall asleep at the wheel, thanks to some help from his assistant. The motive is obvious. Which was? It was the old power struggle in the university routine, Kitty. Old man gets passed over by younger man. Young man gets power, respect, glory. Old man gets older, bitter. Finally, in desperation, the old man gets rid of the one thing in his way, the young man. With Otabi gone, O'Felix becomes department head and gets what has eluded him all his life. Sam, you're simply too much. Yeah. What's the milk for, Kitty? Mm -hmm. You ask too many questions, Sam. Yeah. Garfield, what are you doing in there? Getting ready to roll the credits, pal. My life's full of babes and bullets No time to lay back and cool it I've got clues and claws Right here in my paws Nothing to do but do it Depth charge was too close. Reverse engines. Right full rudder. Ahead one third. Heading three, two, zero. Bring her up. Level off at 16 feet. Up periscope. Bearing mark 202. Range 1600 yards. Open door tube one. Fire torpedo. Direct hit. Good work, men. We gave that tin can the deep six. Let's surface. Morning, Pookie. Have a good night. You look rested. Well, time to kickstart the day. 
Time to wake up John, have some breakfast, take a nap, etc., etc., etc. Just another ordinary run of the mill day. Garfield's coming. He's coming to town. Better not try to knock him down. Just run for cover and clear the street. Cause if you don't, you'll be dead meat. Yeah, Garfield is coming to town. There was Jesse James and Billy the Kid. But this dude's done worse things than they ever did. Woe the poor soul who crosses his path. He'll have to suffer this gunslinger's wrath. <laughs> this poor dog hasn't got a chance. He's had his last meal, and he's had his last dance. One more whimper, one more prayer. Gee, I hope he put on clean underwear. I'm gonna deep fry this sucker. Morning, Odie. <laughs> What's on your docket for the day, pal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. What say we get some breakfast? Okay, let's wake up the cook. Oh, John! And now, ladies and gentlemen, Garfield the Amazing. Good morning, adoring throngs. I am Garfield the Amazing, and this is my comely assistant, Odie the Average. Ta-da! For my first trick, I'm going to perform the tablecloth thing. Yes? I shall now attempt to yank the tablecloth out from under all this stuff on the table. A drum roll, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the world famous tablecloth thing. Here's your breakfast, Garfield. It's about time. Garfield, I wish I knew what goes on in that mind of yours. I know cats have an active fantasy life, but yours must be in Technicolor. You'll never take me alive, you scurvy cur. Sigh. I'm getting concerned, Odie. I think my imagination is starting to run away with me. See you later. Help! Save me! What do you think you're doing, Garfield? I'm not sure anymore. Odie, I have a theory. Huh? Yeah, it just occurred to me that this imagination thing may not be as dangerous as we think. Huh. You know why? Huh. Because John's always there to bail us out. Huh. Come on, we'll put this theory to a test. Uh-oh. Good afternoon, passengers. This is your Captain Garfield speaking. Thank you for flying Inversion Layer Airlines. Our ETA to Chicago today is 4 o'clock. Our altitude is 39,999 feet. Our in-flight movie is Vertigo, and if you think that's in bad taste, wait till you've tried the food. <laughs> the co-pilot this afternoon is Odie Crash Babowski. Say hi to the folks, Crash. Good boy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. And pay no attention to that engine that just exploded. Or that one. Crash, I have an important question to ask you. How many engines do we have on this plane? Mark, mark. I was afraid of that. Well, this calls for action. I know. Have the stewardesses pass out free drinks. Mark. No, wait. Better yet, we'll disguise ourselves as stewardesses, work our way to the back of the plane, and bail out. Uh-uh. 
Okay, crybaby. We'll get the passengers off first. All the passengers are safely off, Crash. Ready to bail out. We overlooked one tiny detail, Crash. We're not wearing parachutes. Didn't you pack enough chutes for us, too? Well, this is just great. Time to test my theory about John being there for us. Feel lucky, Crash? Then let's just do it. Garfield, Odie, <laughs> you guys are crazy, you know that? We did it. You know what this means, Odie? We're invincible. Come on, Odie, on to the next adventure. Gerbils. I should have raised gerbils. The world is filled with excitement, Odie. If you just use your imagination, you don't even have to go find it. It'll find you. Nice touch. Look, Cody, the meaning of life. Sim Salabim, sir. Sim Salabim. May your children be happy and wise. May your chewing gum never lose its flavor. May your camel walk straight and true. May your socks always match. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful sense of humor. Lance Sterling. So we meet once again, sir. Fat guy, so we do. I would like you to meet my associate, raw meat. He doesn't smoke, drink, eat, or sleep. He's been trained in the martial arts, you know. Judo, karate, taekwondo, jiu-jitsu, and uh, machete eating. Big deal. This is my associate, slobber job. He doesn't think. He's been trained in macrame, bonsai, origami, and he's nearly housebroken. What? <laughs> Most impressive, sir. Let's cut the small talk, fat guy. You know why I'm here. Yes, I do. And what I'm here for. Yes, I do. And what I'm going to do with it. Yes, I do. Then would you mind refreshing my memory? You're here to get my half of the Holy Ankh, sir. I knew that. Combined with your half of the Holy Ankh, it will form a map to the location of the Banana of Bombay. You see, slobber job, the Banana of Bombay was the original banana used in the old banana gag. Oh. You remember the old banana gag. Ah. <laughs> yes, it's the symbol of humor to free nations all around the world. The banana of Bombay was stolen from our country's Museum of Humor many years ago. If it falls into the wrong hands, it could be the end of humor as we know it. Oh. Our mission is to recover the banana of Bombay and return it to its rightful place. I, on the other hand, feel the banana of Bombay belongs to the world. I will find it first and auction it off to the highest bidding country. You low-born cur. How dare you seek to profit from the banana of Bombay? Ah, oh, come, Mr. Sterling. Let us piece together our halves of the Holy Ankh so that we may get on with our quests. Very well. Where is your half of the Ankh, fat guy? You didn't think I'd really give you the location, did you, fat guy?
Attention, market shopping people. For the next 10 minutes, we'll be giving away a free flying carpet in aisle 4. <laughs> Who are you? My name is Nadia. Headquarters I sent me here to protect you. Well, thanks anyway, lady, but I don't need your help. I have my orders. Then take this one. Scram. I have work to do. Come, slobber job. You haven't heard the last of me yet, Lance Sterling. Okay, slobber job, let's put the pieces of this puzzle together. You know what to do. <laughs> These two halves of the Ankh will form a map giving us the location of the banana of Bombay. Interesting. Uh -huh. This is only part of the map. According to this, we're to pick up another clue in Paris, on the left bank, on Saint-Germain, I'd say. Uh -huh. Somewhere in the vicinity of Café de Fleur. Come, mon ami. Heel. Oh. Do you have, uh, how you say, microwave lasagna? No, monsieur. Oh, very well. Just give me the soup du jour with some extra jour on the side. An excellent choice, monsieur. What's your special today? I haven't a clue. A clue? Clue? Did you say, did you hear that slobber job? He said clue. Okay, fess up. Where's the banana of Bombay? I don't believe that's on our menu, monsieur. Would you settle for bananas foster? Never mind. There has to be a clue around here somewhere, slobber job. Here is your soup de jour, monsieur. Bon appetite. Thanks, pal. Boy, that guy looks familiar. Nadia, what are you doing here? Protecting you, you fool. Don't you know Fat Guy and Ramit have followed you here to get the clue? Go on. Enjoy your soup de jour, my friend. For there will be no tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Look, slobber job, there appears to be a map drawn on that awning. This must be our clue. Let's get out of here and bring the map with you. I was right, slobber job. See these ancient Incan hieroglyphs here in the corner? Mm-hmm. The banana of Bombay is located in an ancient temple right here on the Amazon River. <sighs> well, pal, nothing can stop us now. Well, here we are on the Amazon slobber job. This isn't exactly the friendliest neighborhood I've seen, but not to worry. If things get too hairy, John is always around to get us out of this fantasy. Now which way do we go? Look, slobber job, a sign. Ah, 
the ancient temple. Good work, slobber job. Proceed with caution, my friend. These walls have eyes. Stop, you fool. Look what would have happened. Now stay behind me and step where I step. That was kind of fun. The banana of Bombay. Slobber job. If you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Well, great. What more could go wrong? This could go wrong, you stupid feline. The banana of Bombay is now mine. Now that the banana of Bombay is yours, you could at least do me the courtesy of telling me why you want it. I am from Moldavia. My country is very poor, you see. So in order to make money, we have decided to encourage tourism. We need this banana in order to open a fruit stand. That is the dumbest reason I've ever heard. It's your fantasy, fat boy. Give me my banana. You'll have to catch me first. Thanks for the banana, Toots. Goodbye forever. I hope someone brought snacks. It looks like we're gonna be here for a while. I'd say, like, forever. Mm-hmm. What is it, slobber job? Slobber job, old buddy. Even Lance Sterling doesn't have a way out of this one. Slobber job, what are you doing? Oh well, I guess it is just a fantasy, isn't it? Hmm, not bad. Go, Nadia. Open a banana peel stand. 
I knew this dream was too good to be true. We have no choice now, slobber job. Here, boy, take my hand. Boy, I hope this doesn't hurt. Last one in's a rotten egg! Another fantasy, Garfield? Yeah, my last one. I ain't never gonna have a fantasy again. No way, no how, no sir. Oh no, not again. Odie, I thought I told you never to play. Its eyes should shine in the dark, and it should always land on its feet. Oh, sure. Hmm. Give cats six eyes. <laughs> we only have two eyes left. Two eyes. I like that. Cranium, 23 pantines, jaw, 12 Botox, no eyebrows. Nice. Hmm. Notice how the heavy lids give it an arrogant yet warm expression. Nice job, staff. You've designed the perfect animal, cat. However, there is one finishing touch. Give it nine lives. Wow. Oh, nine lives. Well, everyone else gets only one life. Well, let's just say it would make a great plot for a story, okay? You see, I was born under a bad sign. Got a reason to cry. The bad signs I was born under could fill up the sky. Yeah, I'm a blue cat. And I'm broke from paying my dues Cause when you got nine lives You got nine ways to lose Hey, I had me nine lives with roll snake eyes again and again And maybe this time I roll me a lucky ten In my first life, I formulated many of my likes and dislikes. I disliked my rock bed. On the other hand, you wouldn't believe the size of the pterodon drumsticks. ago, the first cat crawled out of the sea. His first word was... He had been holding his breath for quite some time. In those days, the first everything was crawling up out of the sea. The first snake. The first chicken. Crab grass. The first real estate salesman. And then came the first girl cat. Oh, man. Near, near, oh, man. Cat! Cat was.
was caveman talk for darn it. It wasn't long before Cave Cat learned to talk. Foom. Foom. No, no, no. Meow. 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 Caveman soon domesticated Cave Cat. Good cat! Good cat! Soon, Cave Cat learned to live with his human counterparts and spent his time pretty much as cats do now. <laughs> Except for the fire-breathing mice. Ah, yes, those were simple times. Times when people had to entertain themselves. Big Bob, come! Ooh, Big Bob! Big Bob, big! Big Bob, bad! Big Bob, go whoop, whoop, whoop! Here, Big Bob! Big Bob. Hence Cat's instinctive fear of dogs. Big Bob slobbered. And ran away. Cave Cat gave Big Bob a piece of his mind. Aha, Big Bob. Cave Cat go whoomp, whoomp, whoomp. Ooh, stay away, Big Bob, or Cave Cat go whoomp, whoomp, whoomp. Alas, Big Bob returned with the world's first and last rap tree. He wanted to play fetch. Thus, the world's first and last cave cat bought the farm for failing to field a fetched rap tree. Two thousand BC was a good year to be a cat in Egypt. We were revered even worshipped. Ah, for the good old days. Ancient Egypt wasn't the arid wasteland you might expect. No, it was bustling with activity in 2000 BC. The pyramids were still under construction. In those days, we cats were venerated and worshipped because of the cat goddess Bastet. She was the head of the hierarchy of animal gods. This was one Egyptian belief that certainly got no argument from us cats. Me? I was known as King Cat. I was the favorite cat of King Amenhotep III. I called him Junior. Those were happy days. I had my own personal bevy of slave dogs, and for fun I'd go over to the pyramids and torture the construction workers. To the pyramid, you mutts, let's get a move on. It doesn't get any better than this. Did I ever tell you I love it when you grovel? Okay, okay, enough adoration. Back to work! instead of a pyramid. Okay, okay, big babies. All right, you, back to work. We got a deadline to meet, you know. I want these pyramids built by Thursday. Hey, have a heart, mate. I'm doing the best I can. 
If you know what's good for you, you'll get your shoulder back to the stone. Yeah, I'd like to get your shoulder back to the stone. What was that? Uh, I just said if you know what's good for you, you'd be back at the temple rather than here picking on us poor slaves. And just what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> Read the glyphs, mate. Writing's on the wall. I don't like the looks of this. That's right, mate. When the king croaks, he takes all his worldly possessions with him. And you are a possession. Get the picture? I got the picture all too clearly. Old Junior's not even bright enough to come in out of a sandstorm. And then to complicate the situation, his evil brother, Prince Black Bart, has had his eyes on the throne for some time now. Ooh, if my lifespan is to coincide with Junior's, I better get back there and protect him from Bart. Giddy up, you doggies. Time's wasted. <laughs> hey, Junior. Hmm? Hey, man. You know I have a surprise for you. Oh, goody, goody, goody. I just love surprises. Where is it? Where is it? It's, uh, through that door. Go, go, go ahead, step through the door. I think you're going to be a surprise. Okay. Mush. Mush. <laughs> Shucks. I don't see any surprise around here. Ooh, sometimes that black part makes me so mad. Rats! <laughs> hey! You shoved me! I'd like to do more than shove you. I'd like to... Go do dee do dee do this is. Oh well, whatever it is, it probably hasn't been invented yet. Then again, what do I know? up and no place to go, huh, Junior? <laughs> what am I laughing about? I should be conserving oxygen. These crypts are airtight. I only have enough air to last about... Let's see, this crypt is about 80 by 40. Let's see, the 20-foot ceiling. Da, 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 da. I'll run out of air in roughly 73 years. anything I can ever do for you, just let me know. You know, Slave Dog, it's friends like you that keep this tired old world going round. Be a good dog and run over to the pyramids to see how things are going. <laughs> yes, sir, right away, sir. Anything you wish, sir. Your wish is my command, sir. was my favorite. My body grew old, but I never, never, never grew up. Your adoring sky is filled with magic butterflies made the morning amazing. 
memory. These were the mornings Chloe and the orange kitten liked best. It seemed like it was always summer in the garden. Uncle Todd built the garden during a very intense period of just having fun. He was known for that. Singing and dancing and being every bit a prankster. He and the sun laughed a lot. <laughs> Uncle Todd joined the circus one spring and sort of willed the garden to Chloe and the orange kitten. From then on, the spirit of Uncle Todd seemed to loom over the plot like a great laughing apparition. This was not the normal garden you might imagine, no. It was inspired by the love of life and the even greater love of living it. The garden had a few of the more identifiable features, of course, like plants and rocks and some fun things. But the things they really enjoyed were not of the norm. Designed into the garden were things like tubes, globes, and orbs of the bubble and vinyl persuasion. The hovering harmonica, the skimming discs, made cheerful sounds as they glided from point to point. Their lively syncopated rhythms filled the air. The great part was as Chloe and the kitten moved from one area of the garden to another, the environment would change. All the areas were for fun making, but only a special love and understanding would make the garden work. They had a very strong bond, a rare and valuable treasure called friendship. <laughs> Magic life, an easy life, a good life. There was only one condition. Before Uncle Todd joined the circus, he left the two a crystal box on a checkered toadstool. He told them never to open the crystal box. Chloe and the kitten were not used to rules. This never open the crystal box on the checkered toadstool rule was new to them. children are want to do. Chloe and the kitten were overcome with curiosity. They poked at the crystal box, sniffed it, and gazed longingly at the simple to open latch. There is something very special about a box that is not to be opened. Finally, they decided to take action. They loved Uncle Todd very much. It was right before the garden. And they lived happily forever and ever 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 and ever. I learned to think on my feet in my fourth life. Thinking was okay, I guess, but now I avoid it whenever possible. The year is 1720. I'm the cat of the court musician to King George I. My owner's a fellow named George Frederick Handel. I sit around and watch Freddie write music for George's dinner parties. Freddie's putting the finishing touches on a fugue for a big bash tonight. <laughs> Hello, Freddy. What have we here? Oh, go away, Jester. I must have this fuke done for tonight or the king will have my neck. <laughs> fuke? Fuke, you say? This is a very important occasion. George is expecting a concerto, don't you know? A concerto? Is there an echo? That's right, Governor. He's expecting a concerto. Oh, there's not time. I can't possibly finish a concerto by this evening. Oh, that's too bad. 
Oh, well, if we can't enjoy a concerto tonight, we'll have fun at the execution. <laughs> execution? There's that echo again. Oh, well, ta-ta, Freddy. Your concerto had better be good. You know how Georgie hates to be disappointed. Here, Cat. I will take the first movement and the second movement and you do the finale right fast. There's not much time. Your Majesty, Your Majestress, for your listening pleasure this evening, it is my pleasure to present Freddy and his chamber quartet, who will play for you an original concerto, or so we hope, on this very auspicious occasion. Freddy, if you please. <laughs> stuck with it, there would have been the recording contracts, the concerts, the agents, the managers, the roadies, the groupies. It sounded like a lot of work to me. Life number five was short. Hey, Cat, you're wanted on the set. I'll be right back. Cut! Stunt Cat! That's a wrap. Six must be my lucky number, because that's the life I fell in love with music. I also fell in love with a girl who played the piano just for me. Oh, what a pretty day. Would you like to hear a cat story, Patches? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you anyway. My eighth birthday turned out to be one of the most memorable days of my life. That was the day I got a new kitten, and I took my first piano lesson. Oh, I remember it as if it were yesterday. I was sitting at the kitchen table having breakfast when my mother came into the room. Happy birthday, Sarah. I have something for you. A kitten? Oh, thank you, Mommy. If you take good care of your kitten, Sarah, it will be a good, good friend for a long time to come. Mother suggested that I name my new kitten Diana after the Roman goddess of the hunt. Sarah, I have another birthday surprise for you. This is Mrs. Underwood. She's going to give you piano lessons. Oh, Mom, I want to play with Diana. Come along, Sarah. Someday you're going to thank me for this. All right, Sarah, let's begin. Diana, are you all right? During 
the next few months, I worked very hard at my piano lessons. Every time I sat down to play, I would feel this little paw on my foot. Diana was so tiny, she couldn't get up on the piano by herself. I wanted to be a better piano player because Diana always seemed to sense when I hit a wrong note. In just a few years, I was becoming, by Diana's standards, a fairly good pianist. Diana loved my music and never seemed happier than when I was playing. Those were happy days. I remember the sunshine, soft summer breezes, and the fun Diana and I had. It seemed as though Diana had been part of my life forever. I had even promised Diana we would never, ever part. Then came the day I left for college. That was a sad day. I didn't know who I was going to miss more. My parents or Diana. Although I was a young woman by the time I graduated from college, the little girl in me was still eager to be with Diana once again. By that time, my world had changed. There were more people in my life than Diana and my parents. And I don't know that Diana approved. Mother? Father, Lee and I have decided to marry. Oh, that's wonderful, dear. Ouch! Diana! You'd better pack your bags, old girl. You're going to be moving soon. You're coming with me. My parents had given Lee and me the piano as a wedding present. We really didn't have room for it. But it was our most important piece of furniture. When little Billy came along, Diana found a new friend. I don't think Diana minded too much. By now, Diana was 14. Diana could no longer make it on her own to the top of the piano. But fortunately, neither could little Billy. That evening, I could tell Diana wasn't feeling well, so I put Billy to bed early and performed a whole concert just for Diana. I'd never play better. When I finished, Sometime during the night, Diana managed to get down onto the keyboard. She lay down, put her face on her folded paws, and quietly passed away. It was Diana's testament to her love for my music. Would you like me to play something for you, Patches? In my seventh life, I was a laboratory animal. To this day, every time I see a test tube, I throw up. Hold on to that cat good and tight now, Larry. Easy now, fella. Easy there. I don't know about you, Larry, but these experiments sound like something out of a horror movie to me. All I know is if this research goes bad, I'm going to put plenty of distance between me and this laboratory. Larry, 
get 19 GB ready for dissection, we'll see if it's experienced any preliminary organ modification. Get that cat! I'm trying, I'm trying! Guys, we'll never find him now. All that I ever was made me what I am in my eighth life. Somehow, it's falling short of my expectations. of an Italian restaurant. Are Italians good to eat? <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot to learn, Garfield. Garfield, the newborn kitten, is getting ready to rub up against his first leg. On my mark, get set, rub up. thing called eating. Pasta. Infinite mountains of pasta. Garfield. 
Garfield one, Fettuccine nothing. This for gay could stand to be cooked a little longer. <laughs> Come on with me, kitty. You eat in the me out of my business. I'm a taking you, kitty, to the pet shop. I can't let him stay here. No, you can't take him. He's too young. Oh, come on, Mom. I'm a big boy. I'm five minutes old now. Besides, I'm getting tired of hanging around the house all the time. Take care of yourself, little boy. I love you. I love you too, Mom. And thanks for everything you've done for me. I'll write when I get a chance. <laughs> Thanks for the ride. Hi, guys. So, what's the program here? Oh, it's simple. All you have to do is look cute. Someone comes in, buys you, takes you home. That shouldn't take long. Don't count on it. Old Eli's been here 17 years. I'm cute. Take me home. <laughs> ah! What's that? Oh, that? That's a dog. People actually buy them and take them home as pets. Hello there. I'd like to buy a cat. Take me, take me. I'll catch you mice, fetch your paper, scratch your back. Take me. Oh, this one seems friendly. I sleep till noon and I desire my milk tepid. I require three daily scratchings and I eat a pasta-based diet. No substitution foods. As far as accommodation. How are you this morning, Garfield? I'm in a good mood. I let the mailman live. Uh, sit down, Garfield. Uh, I have something to tell you. I am sitting down. You must be lonely. I think you need a playmate. Not really. I have my mirror. So, I bought a dog. <laughs> You're taking it rather badly, Garfield. I think I'm okay now. Where is this dog? Garfield, meet Odie. It's not a dog, it's a tongue with eyeballs and feet. It's as though I know Odie from a former life. A bad one. Well, it's taken a lot of hard work, intimidation, and abuse, but it was worth the effort to lay claim to my position as the rightful head of this household. Odie, oh, Odie, be a good boy and fetch my slippers. They're on the wrong feet, dummy. Now run, fetch my owner. You called, master? Ain't life great. I assume you would like to have lunch now. Yes, and I desire a picnic on the lawn. You want what? Read my lips, John. I want to eat outside today. Very well, sir. It's hard to find good help. Come on, Odie. It's the ice cream truck. You must have a death wish, fella. If Odie hadn't stopped me, I would have been a cat pancake, a pavement pelt, a sail cat, a greasy spot on Main Street. You saved my life, old buddy. Listen, I may not be wildly successful in this life, Odie, but at least I'm alive to live it, and that means something. I'll forever be grateful to you, Odie. I'll never forget this. <laughs> Gather round, children. It's story time. It was back in the 80s, or, or was it the 90s? Who cares? At any rate, I was a big TV celebrity and a mouser of some note. Well, sir, one day, Odie and I spotted the ice cream truck across the street. As Odie was just about to run into the street, I saw this big truck a-coming. 
I had determined that Ori was going to be seriously hurt if he crossed the street. And so I wrestled him to the ground at the last minute before the truck came rushing by and squashed him. I'd like to think I'll live forever, but hey, I'm only human. Here's a sneak preview of my ninth life. Space. One thing to be said for space, there sure is a lot of it out there. So what do you do with space? You can take part in grand intergalactic battles that encompass whole solar systems, or you can bravely forge new worlds of exploration by traveling through uncharted territory, or you can get lost. Me? I'm lost. Finding out where the heck I am is still secondary, though. What I want to know is, why am I here? Welcome to space, Mr. Cat. I suppose you are wondering why you are here. A keen grasp of the obvious. Well, it is really quite simple. You see, all we require is that you survive, Mr. Cat. We are monitoring the survival instincts of a cat in his last life. In his la la last life? As you are well aware, a cat has nine lives. And uh, don't tell me, I'm living life number nine? I tell it like it is, baby. Cakes. Well, that's just great. Somehow my lives didn't mean so much when I had a few of them to burn. So here I am in the one that really counts and they stick me in the middle of nowhere in this time bomb. Well, I'd better gather my wits about me. My survival sounds like a job for ODIE, my operations data index element. It's the smartest machine in the galaxy. Hey, Odie, index and rate all variables in my survival and give me a progressive plan. He says, Odie must have been built by the lowest bidder. Well, I guess it's up to me now. Just what do I have on hand to survive with? Let's see. I have food, water, artificial gravity, and sand. Well, time to start surviving. Let's eat. Oh well, everything tasted like lettuce anyway. Okay, Odie, what is it? Hey! Where's gravity when you need it? What are you trying to say, Odie? Mac. Here, take this. I've been declawed. Hey, uh, guys, could you give me just a little more time? This place is a fright, and I couldn't meet my maker looking like this. Come on, have a heart. I'm sorry. We of the IHGWF have no hearts. We do, however, appreciate the tiny ship. We will give you seven minutes instead of five. Gee, thanks. There's not much time. I need more hands. That's it, hands. If I can just get over to the crew cloner here, I'll clone the crewmate. I hate vending machines. Six minutes! Hey, Odie, we gotta do something about this gravity. <laughs> That's it, the gravity machine. Pull the handle. <laughs> That's better. Just when things look bleak, something goes right. 
The plot thickens. Five minutes! Now to get those guns working. Get out of here. Shoot! Shoot! Get back! Why don't you guys play in traffic or something? That's it. Odie? Take these guys down to the launch platform. Put these clones in the drones. We'll launch an all-out attack on Commander Mendelssohn and his Igwa, Wega, Hagawa, whatever. Hurry! Okay, Commander. Brace yourself. This cat has a thing or two up his sleeve. Are the drones in place for launching? <laughs> Commander Mendelssohn, Commander Mendelssohn, are you there? You have three minutes. What happened to four minutes? Well, I, uh... You what? I had to go to the little boy's room. I have a surprise for you, Commander. Take this. <laughs> get those guns working. One minute. Boy, what a day. Lost, no food, a twit for a computer, an imbecile for a crewmate. But no matter. I'm a hero, and heroes don't die. We always win our space battles. This ought to do it. Zero. Nice touch. My name is Garfield, and uh, this is my friend Odie. I understand you boys had a rough go of it in your last life. Yes, sir, and, and that's why I'm here, frankly. I know cats have nine lives, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to have them, but I don't think it was fair for anyone to put us in the position we were in. Now, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. You're right. But, sir, I... I'm right? Yes, you are. You may have your life back. Oh, by the way, which life was that? You mean, which life of my nine was that? Yes. Y you mean, you don't keep track? Normally I do, but our computers are on the blink right now. Why, that was my, um, my first life, sir. Very well. Then you're entitled to all nine lives. And your friend there, is he a cat too? Well... Yeah, he is. Then so be it. You both have all nine lives. We have to stick together, you know. <laughs> 